All right, here we are. Welcome everyone. We are here today to talk about advanced incident response and threat hunting using Sentinel-1 and Intizer. I'm Shannon McFarland here with the Intizer team and I've also got Shaw Holtzman, our brilliant di director of sales engineering here to cover all the technical details and best practices you'll wanna know. Before I pass the mic over to Shaw, I just wanna let you all know, we'll send out an email afterwards with the recording of the webinar uploaded to our YouTube channel, also the slides, so you can reference that in the video. And then I'll be in the chat the whole time to help um, answer questions and collect anything that you want answered by Shaw later at the end. So just drop your questions into the chat as you think of them. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can in the Q&A at the end. And now it's my turn to pass it over to Shaw so you can introduce yourself a bit more and get into the topic of really, you know, how can people really change how they're thinking about incident response and um, threat hunting. Thank you very much, Shannon. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. My name is Shaul. I'm going to introduce myself in a minute. The topic of today's webinar is automating incident response with Sentinel-1 and Intezer, which means, of course, Intezer uh, can help you automate alerts coming from Sentinel-1. Uh, it's not only Sentinel-1, but this, focuses, uh, this webinar focuses specifically on that. So I hope that uh, our uh, listeners and, and uh, whoever is watching is using Sentinel-1. And of course, feel free to, to leave questions in the chat. Uh, if you uh, participated in the last webinar we did with the Sentinel-1 team, um, I'm sorry to be uh, repeating on a few of the things that we discussed. And generally, I'm going to go through uh, these uh, slides to explain the setting, the issue, uh, and possible solutions. But most of this webinar will be uh, going over the solution itself and technically uh, explaining it, explaining it. Uh, so I hope that uh, you, you bear with me. Um, and generally, this shouldn't be too long. I'm not going to talk for a full hour, I hope. Um, and I hope that you get uh, relevant information from this. So we're going to start with the setting. What is the issue? How does the uh, security operations field look like today? And what are the, the challenges the teams are facing? Um, how that can be solved or improved using automation and what kind of automation solutions are out there. And then I'm simply going to go into the solution and demonstrate. Um, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So you can already start putting them there. So let's begin with the, with myself. Uh, sorry. Uh, so again, Shaul Holtzman, um, uh, I've been in Intezer for the past almost five years. Um, I have a background of incident response, malware analysis, forensics uh, over the past 10 years. Um, and I'm really happy to, to demonstrate this. I've been in, with Intezer since the beginning, so uh, I can explain you know, the, the way we've, we've come and the, the information we have from clients in the security operations uh, world. So uh, I, I hope that this will be interesting for you. Uh, so starting with some obvious points, uh, security operations are changing. You have more attacks. It's easier uh, to carry out more complex attacks. You have more technology, more SaaS platforms, uh, more devices, so more attack services. Uh, and with that, of course, come more security products, which mean uh, that you have more alerts. Uh, there's no way around it. You have more solutions, which generate more events, which generate more alerts. Um, that means that with the same team that you have, uh, whether it be uh, a multi-tiered SOC, whether it's a small team, whether it's outsourced, uh, you have uh, uh, more things to do for that team. Uh, we already know that a huge amount of security teams have more alerts that they can handle and are working in a way to, to put out those fires. Um, organizations that had breaches uh, that attrib were attributed to gaps in their skills and the team skills. Uh, and there is a struggle now also to recruit and hire and retain uh, cybersecurity talent because all of these issues, you come to a job and you're doing more than you're expected to simply because the reasons that we've described. Uh, so those are some of the challenges here. Um, now, the possible solutions um, that we see are mostly outsourcing this problem 
to another team. That means that you don't have to maintain a full SOC on, on uh, in your organization. And that makes sense. A SOC is 24 seven usually, uh, very advanced technical people, a lot of turnover. Uh, it's very difficult to, to maintain a lot of solutions that you need to purchase and maintain uh, infrastructure. Uh, so people are moving mostly to um, MDRs, MSSPs, um, whether completely outsourcing, some of them outsourcing tier one, which means the initial triage and uh, uh, classification, and then the advanced uh, tasks are carried out by a local team. Sometimes they uh, uh, outsource both or outsource also tier three, when they need more advanced investigations, they can also use an outsource team. Uh, there are some challenges with that as well. Um, from our experience, MDRs are very expensive. Uh, again, you're hiring a team to manage this and, and people are expensive, obviously. It makes sense. Um, with those MDRs handling multiple clients at the same time, they are stretched as well. And eventually, even though that you're outsourcing this problem, the problem doesn't go away for the MDR. They also need to maintain that team and they need to stretch across multiple organizations. Uh, and also when you have that kind of a team, you might see inconsistent services, um, different analysts providing different uh, information, um, different times uh, of response, et cetera. So that is what we see for outsourcing. Um, what Intelzer offers is an automated solution for this. The goal is to provide a consistent service, uh, providing accurate results and actionable intelligence. This means that not only saying this is malicious, this is not, but also giving you information that will help you be secure in the future. That includes proactive hunting, that includes providing uh, relevant artifacts that you can use for hunting immediately as the attack happens um, and uh, giving enough context for the attack in order for you to understand what you need to do in order to remediate. Um, there are many questions and I'll be addressing the slide in a moment, but there are many questions in cybersecurity, in security operations. I remember from my time as, uh, an, as a responder, one of those questions is, is this malicious or not? And it's much more difficult than it sounds. Um, and in the end, a lot of decisions are made, made based on hunches and uh, educated guesses, uh, because it's difficult to determine whether something is legitimate. Um, sometimes even more than it is to determine uh, or to say that it is malicious. Uh, the second thing is, what do I do? Uh, okay, I know it's malicious, but what now? Um, so essentially the, the answer should be according to the possible capabilities of this threat, you need to look for one, two, three and verify that it is not uh, completely in fact the, the, uh, the endpoint or it did, but here it is and this is what you need to do to remove it. And the second part is, did it spread? Um, how do I look for it? And this is of course relevant to hunting and being able to extract the relevant and right detection content, the relevant IOCs. Um, and of course, a, a, a last question I think that is relevant in that regard is how do I make sure that this doesn't happen before? How do I know where it came from in the beginning? Was it a human error? Was it a breach uh, in my organizational security apparatus? So with that, let's uh, look at what Intezer can uh, provide. Uh, so Intezer in the beginning uh, provided a SaaS solution for analyzing different types of files, artifacts, endpoints, URLs, etc. And today uh, we are doing that in an automated fashion. Uh, this means that we are able to receive alert information from a variety of sources. Of course, today we're going to specifically focus on Sentinel-1. And with that information, we can uh, provide the relevant context for the analyst to make a decision and sometimes carrying actions automatically as well. So just to explain this uh, uh, architecture, you have Intezer in the middle and again, completely SaaS based. So you don't need to install anything. Uh, most of the process here is to get, if we want to set up this connection, to get credentials uh, to your environment uh, in order for us to, to be able to access and grab information. And then everything is done on our side. Uh, I think that's the, the true meaning of SaaS. You don't need to deploy anything locally. Now we can connect to your EDR. And again, we're talking about Sentinel-1. Uh, 
Um, and each new incident will trigger an analysis on Interzero side. We can take the file, command lines, and other relevant artifacts from the alert, and then analyze them to be able to provide you with the triage information that you need. So uh, for example, if we see a malicious file, we'll bring back that information and a lot of context for you to make a decision. And if it's a false positive, we're able to say that. And uh, based on your configuration, we can also automatically close and reclassify that alert. So you can you know, say goodbye to 30, 40, 50. Sometimes we've seen clients with 85% false positives. In addition to Sentinel-1, I'll just mention this because it's not the main focus here, but we can also connect to source solutions. And through that, we can also cover your email gateway. And our goal, just to give you a, a bit of information about the future, is to uh, add support for additional alert sources, such as network, identity, etc. Today, we know that the majority of alerts usually coming uh, are usually coming from you know, EDR and emails. Now, with that information, we can enrich, we can act upon this information, and we can also proactively hunt the, uh, in the, the platform. So we can generate the relevant queries based on the artifacts that we find, and we can reactively or proactively hunt for these threats and also trending threats out there. This means that you, again, are more protected and you learn from previous incidents. Uh, the information by default goes to the, uh, the EDR, so, so Sender 1, you'll see the information there about what we found, but it can also connect to the relevant uh, case management platforms because we know people like working in a single place. We don't want to move between different solutions, so we can connect to Jira, XOR, Splunk, et cetera, depending on the need. Um, your security team has access and control over all of these uh, facets, and as I mentioned uh, as well, we receive and we collect threat intelligence for our proactive hunting. So we can also search for trending threats. So let that sink in. You can take screenshots. You, have, you will have the recording. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, feel free. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, so just a bit of what kind of information we provide in order to be able to uh, provide that automated tier one and automated security operations. So one thing here is to cover alert triage uh, as the SOC does for tier one. So all endpoints, email alerts can be monitored, you know, uh, 24 seven because it is automated. Uh, we can also provide full memory analysis and I'll show that in the demo. Uh, in addition to file analysis, we can identify close false positives as I mentioned, providing context, IOCs, recommendations uh, for remediation, sorry. Um, and based on the information, you can also this can also be escalated to the relevant teams. Hunting, as I mentioned, will occur um, uh, proactively or reactively based on alerts. And in addition, uh, just for your uh, context, we can also provide an added I, uh, incident response retainer, a team, uh, because we understand the need uh, for a human team to be able to view and support and answer questions. So that is also part of that solution. Um, how does that this fit into to existing uh, pipelines? So again, we have the detection system. We have source that can aggregate that information. That can be sent either, as I mentioned, to in-house teams, outsourced MDRs, or to Intezer and so, uh, solve that based on technology. And as a tier three, as I mentioned, you have also our MDR. Uh, I want to uh, pause here and explain why Intuzer of all the solutions can provide this, this uh, level of, of context, because there are endless solutions out there that can provide uh, file detonation, uh, behavioral analysis, et cetera, and can give you, you know, as you would try to connect the sandbox to your alerting source, uh, it's not that simple. And the reason why Intuzer is more successful than others in this field is because of our core technology. Uh, and this is based on this core assumption. We know that uh, over 80%, this is based on research, uh, but it's also common knowledge and, and uh, common sense. The, the majority of threats out there are based on re, uh, reuse uh, um, their code, their artifacts, their techniques, um, and you can see connections and mutations between these threats. Not only threats, 
uh, but also legitimate software can reuse uh, uh, code from previous versions, use uh, their techniques, behavior. So our technology is based on that ability to compare and identify reused artifacts, code, techniques, and be, be able to tell you very quickly where this code has been seen before. Where has this pattern of behavior been seen before? And that way we can classify threats and give you even the name of the, the attacker, the vendor, and we can also provide you with a variety of detection content, not only what you can expect usually, uh, which is uh, network-based artifacts, hash-based artifacts, which are ever-changing, and uh, you know you won't be able to use that uh, address tomorrow. Uh, we can provide very deep, uh, very useful uh, detection content based on behavioral artifacts uh, with minimal false positives, because we are able to tell you no, this artifact was seen in trusted software. It's not relevant for future detection. So this is the core of this technology, and this is why we're able to provide that level of context. Um, just last thing, I want to, to explain what kind of capabilities the solution provides as part of its analysis, and then we're going to the demo. Um, so sandboxing, disassembly, and code analysis, unpacking of packed uh, and obfuscated samples, full memory analysis, URL analysis, that's all in the analysis uh, uh, section. Then we can correlate the code, the behavior, TTPs, uh, and uh, additional artifacts to tell you what you actually can use uh, to uh, provide additional detection, et cetera. And we also add, of course, several layers of logic uh, um, uh, above this, uh, because there are different types of threats, different types of alerts, different types of solutions, and we need to, to replicate um, that those scenarios as much as possible. Uh, so this is what goes into this, this connector. Uh, and with that, let's move to the demo. So I'll just switch the, the screen here. I will start on uh, Intercer Analyze, our solution, and then I'm going to show you how it looks like on Sentinel-1. So what you're able to see now is the main dashboard of Intezer. Uh, again, we don't require you to use multiple dashboards. Uh, I'm just using this to show you the value that can be provided here and how it looks like. Uh, so in this example, this is real uh, uh, data from one of our clients. Um, and you can see here that we have the collection stage. So we collect the alerts from Sentinel-1, XOR, and other sources. We analyze the information. Uh, at the triage level. In this case, you can see that almost 50% of the alerts here that are analyzed are false positives. So half of the work you don't need to do. And this depends on the client, of course, as I mentioned, we see sometimes 20%, sometimes 85% false positive alerts based on behavior and based on legitimate software acting strangely, um, which just happens. Um, another important uh, facet here is our ability to cluster these threats. So not only do we see here the percent for false positive, 30% confirmed threats. You don't need to look at it as thousands of, of alerts here that you need to treat. You need to look at it uh, as clusters of threats that are repeating themselves. So we see TrickBot, we see Formbook, uh, we see Mimikatz, and this is based on our ability to classify. So you have a very clear view of what's attacking your organization. On the right here, you have your watch list. So I can add families or groups that are of interest uh, to myself, to my sector, etc., and uh, add them to the watch list, subscribe to them, and get updates through email. Uh, and you have your publicly trending threats that will be, if you enable it, uh, hunted for in your organization automatically daily. Um, so that's a bit of our, about our dashboard. Let's focus here on Sentinel-1 and dive in. So this is the Sentinel-1 dashboard. Um, and if I can see it you know, like so in Intezer, this is how it would look like when you use Sentinel-1 directly. I'm going to go over this quickly because this is something I went over in the last webinar as well. I just want to provide this context. Then I'm going to go into a different scenario, a bit more advanced and interesting, that can allow us also to, to act um, you know, following the detection. So just to go over this, I have a few alerts here. Um, in the usual day-to-day, -day, 
if I didn't have integer, I would go over one by one, starting with whatever looked more urgent. In this case, ransomware looks more, most urgent, so let's just do it. Um, and what I see here is a surprising lack of information. Uh, and when I started working with EDRs, I was actually surprised about the lack of context and information. Detection is one thing, but then telling you where it came from, what it did, what it can do, whether it's really a risk or not, that's much more difficult. And that's where we come in. So you can look at the threat indicators. Um, you have some information here, but using Intezer's note, which again is added automatically through our SaaS platform without you needing to install anything, you can see that this is actually riskware, which is classified as Monero. So not ransomware, but more akin to coin mining or uh, in this case, it's actually a wallet application. So of course, it shouldn't be in the organization, but instead of waking up the CISO in the middle of the night, uh, I would just call the user and ask uh, if they used it or did they download it or uh, they didn't and it shouldn't be there and can be removed. So that's our ransomware done in a few seconds. Um, let's just go back. Excellent. Um, this one I think is also very interesting uh, because it's so common. Um, this alert, again, it says malware. It has many threat indicators relatively, persistence, evasion, information stealer. So that's why it was detected based on behavior. However, you can see clearly he here, this is a false positive identified as jump cloud. Uh, this is actually a software that we use internally in Intezer for uh, uh, authentication. And we've seen it uh, pop up many times. And because this kind of software is installed very deeply, in the operating system and has far reaching uh, permissions, it can very easily be identified as malicious. So this again is something that I would spend a lot of time on if I was an analyst, if I didn't have the context. Um, and using this, I don't need to look at it at all. Even more so, you can actually see that it was already marked as benign and uh, classified here as a false positive. This did not happen manually, it happened automatically, and you can see it here. So again, if enabled, this is not the default. Default is read-only, you can say. Uh, but the automated remediation action here was changing the verdict to false positive and the status to resolve. So if you filter out resolved, which you should, no more false positive, guys. Uh, of course, that sounds too good to be true, and I'm sure that there still will be some, but as you saw earlier, 50% is just the beginning. Um, so this is our false positive example. And one last example here is for real malware. And then we're going to go for a, a bit more of an advanced sample. So again, you can see here in the context, it looks exactly the, like the, the false positive I just showed. Um, and you can see here threat indicators even less. Now, this is not saying anything against Sentinel-1. Every EDR has this challenge. They can detect. But then the context is lacking. Uh, so even if there is really suspicious behavior, you want to see that the more you detect, the more false positives you'll have. But also, it's more likely that you'll find real threats. So the, the, the thing that people are missing, as I, I, I mentioned at the beginning, is that filtering uh, ability, the triage that is done usually by tier one and could be done here by Intercer. So what we see here is very helpful. Uh, we can know this is a confirmed threat, it's malicious, and it's classified as NJRAT. Already, mind blown, a lot of information. But wait, we can also see that it's recommended to block, quarantine, and apply IOCs. Blocking and quarantining uh, was already done by the EDR, we can see that. Apply IOCs means take a look at the indicators and look for them, because already it's killed, but how do we know uh, that it's completely gone. Uh, do we know whether it has persistence? Well, actually, we do here. Uh, so we can see here IOCs. There are four indicators that I can look at. Um, TTPs, the, the tactics, the, the, the techniques. So you have persistence and evasion. So lucky that we were able to find it and detect it, thanks to Sentinel-1. Uh, but persistence is the worst thing I, I would uh, want to see here because that means I have some cleaning up to do probably. Um, so I have to verify this. So in order to, to do this, let's jump to the analysis itself. 
And that's the link you have there always to the analysis, whether it's legit, whether it's not. Again, we saw this came from a file on the disk, uh, but we don't know, was it successful? Did it uh, you know, co communicate outside? Did it persist? So that's something that we can use Intersert to find out. First, this is the analysis. This is how the analysis looks like. You can see static analysis of the code here that allowed us to classify this as NJRAT and provide this information. And you can also see that the file was executed. So we can also see uh, additional artifacts, additional payloads, behavior being loaded into memory. So first, we're going to start with TTPs. We saw already in the note that there are persistence capabilities. This is all mapped to MITRE uh, and evasion capabilities. I would want to start by looking at the persistence. Uh, before that, I can also see that there's a useful um, uh, technique here, um, sniff keystrokes. That means that this malware has the ability to sniff keystrokes, which means they can steal, potentially can steal credentials. So already I have an action item for the user, update your passwords. Uh, and it's really important to have those action items for the user and for the team so you can properly mitigate. Evasion, it uses injection uh, in order to uh, evade detection and persistence. This is what I wanted to look at. It installs itself uh, in several places. So I can see here uh, in the uh, registry run uh, key in the start directory. So I'll just need to take these paths Use I can use Sentinel-1 deep visibility to look for them, or I can go to the machine itself and simply verify that these paths uh, are not there. If they are, I would delete them. Um, this will enable it, uh, me actually to, to respond and to clean the organization without the need to re-image the machine. And that's something that many people do. They have a real threat, they format the machine, it takes so long and it's a, a huge pain for the user. It's not necessary. It's possible in 2022 to clean malware without re-imaging the machine. Um, and I'll give you some, some more information about that soon. Uh, now, I'm going to jump to detect and hunt here. TTPs help me understand what I need to do to locally remediate. Detect and hunt will provide me with all the relevant uh, artifacts that I need to hunt across the organization. So, uh, as you see, this is not a regular list of IOCs. You have here process tree structures, registry keys, network artifacts, command line, uh, uh, commands that were executed, file paths, etc. All of these are classified as NJRAT, and you can see it's not a huge amount of, of uh, uh, artifacts, even though under the behavioral analysis, we had much more hundreds of registry keys. We managed to filter them to only the ones that are relevant for detection here, uh, based on where they appeared before. Now, from this list, you can simply choose. So let's uh, look at the, the list. So I can choose this, this, and this, for example. And I have the ability to extract the rule uh, and generate it automatically. I can do that for Sentinel-1 and CrowdStrike today. I'm going to show you how that actually looks like in the next example, because I want to get to it. Um, so with that, Let's move to, to another scenario. We went over false positives, true positives, uh, and, and what to do with them, how they look like. Now I'm going to go to the last 24 hours to see some recent attacks in our organization. You can see here that this DLL was triggered. It triggered a detection. Again, I get malware. So let me jump in. Um, and you can see this happened a few hours ago. My time currently is 5.30 uh, p.m. So uh, a few hours ago, I had this alert. And you can see, and again, so easy. You can see this is a confirmed threat, malicious, Quackbot. Quackbot is trending, by the way. This is why I use this for, for this example. Um, this threat, the way it spreads, just to give you the context, it, it sends you an HTML page, uh, which looks like phishing. It downloads a zip, in that zip there's an ISO file, in that ISO file you have a link file. If you click that link file, it sideloads a DLL in mem into memory and, and yeah. <laughs> so uh, what you see here again is a Quackbot, you need to block it. You have discovery, execution, evasion, and command and control. So already 
this is super urgent. At the time, what I did was deploy our endpoint scanner in order to understand more about what's going on on that machine. Um, so I can, of course, jump to the file here, but I do want to show you what that means uh, to run the endpoint scanner. So Intezer provides a memory scanning utility. It's part of the solution, and it's critical also uh, to provide the full uh, visibility that you need in security operations in the Sender One um, and Sender One integration. I'll explain why. Um, the file gives me a lot of information. I can know here for Quackbot, by the way, you can already see this, uh, what kind of capabilities it has. It creates a schedule task. We're gonna go over this. It has command, uh, command and control capabilities. This is very important. Just a sec, I was a bit stuck. I'll just open it again, because the last thing I want is my browser to crash. Just one moment, sorry. Here we go. So I saw TTPs. Uh, I, I have detect and hunt uh, indicators. What I want to emphasize here is that I don't know what is running at the moment on my uh, infected host. Sentinel-1 tells me that it was uh, killed here, but I have to verify because especially it has persistence mechanisms. I saw it can create a schedule task, so it might have been killed, but if that task exists, it can execute again. So our endpoint scanner is uh, a one executable file that you can execute or deploy remotely on any machine and get a full memory analysis of the code that was running at the time. This is invaluable to SOC teams because who in the right mind spends time today on memory analysis, memory forensics? No one has time for that. You need to take a memory dump, analyze it, download it, transfer it to, to, testing, to, to an investigation network. And then you don't really know what you're looking for. Uh, with Entezer, I'm gonna show you how it looks like. Um, you have the ability to very clearly and very fast understand whether the machine is infected or not. You can see here, I ran several of these scans on this machine. The last one, again, right after the infection, gives me an infected verdict. Just look at what this analysis provides. So it tells me, and this took about three minutes to sense deployment until it gives me the result. Uh, it tells me that the machine is infected with Quackbot. Where is it? So I can see here this, is the infected payloads. Again, I can see this file name, this file path that I already got from Sentinel-1. But please note, and this is something I noticed recently, what is the process ID? I can see it originated from run DLL, but I don't see a process ID. There is no process ID. So I don't know what to terminate or how to check even if it's still running. So here, I know that, sorry, here, I know that the process ID is this, and in this case, it executed through Regis VR32. So I know exactly which process to look for, which file to look for uh, in order to mitigate this. By the way, you can also see that other uh, files here, uh, are or other processes, sorry, are identified as legitimate. This same machine was scanned just before and was clean. So this is how, how it would look like when it is clean. So the, the way to deploy the scanner, you can do it manually. You can download the scanner here in the, the website, but even better, you can just go here to actions, run script. You can choose the script here, run endpoint scanner. You put your API key here. I won't do it now because it's mine, it's private. Uh, you choose no output, next, next, and it runs. Uh, you will you'll be able to see, uh, maybe if I have my tasks here, perhaps I'll show it later, um, but that is what we can, we can do. Um, it is going to, in the next version of the platform, be deployed fully automatically. So once you have this detection, it will be deployed. So you'll have the scan in your arsenal when you need it. Now, uh, let's go back to the file itself and try to understand how can we uh, mitigate it, how can we hunt for it. So as you saw, in Detect and Hunt, I have 
uh, different network artifacts. And this is useful because we saw that there is a CNC communication possibility. If we read a bit about Quackbot, you can also see that it's known uh, as an information stealer, a credential stealer. So that's what we're afraid of. Um, so I would use the network artifacts here to check whether uh, communication was uh, happening from this machine and whether it was successful. Uh, but I also want, and this is what you see, see here, this is a command that created a scheduled task. Uh, we can see a name of the scheduled task in the command, uh, but the name looks generated. And I can see that it's a PowerShell uh, running an encoded command, uh, which usually means you have the uh, scheduled task, which usually executes and then downloads something uh, or sends something out to the CNC. I want to check whether this uh, uh, artifact exists in Sentinel-1. So one thing I can do is just go to Deep Visibility, or you can click on Hunt Now. And what I want to look for is Task Path it contains, in any case, PowerShell. I just want to see, uh, because if there is a scheduled task running PowerShell, it usually is malicious. Of course, there are some applications, I, I assume, that use it for updates, but not usually. And you can see the exact command I mentioned around the time of the alert. So we can see that the command was executed. Is the, uh, the task there? Uh, we'll need to verify, but it looks like it is because this is running every few minutes. So most likely you have a scheduled task there that's doing this. Of course, the, the, the easiest thing in the world, go to the machine uh, or open it remotely, delete the task, verify that there are no more tasks, look at the startup uh, directories, et cetera, but it doesn't look like it persists through there based on the TTPs. So this is one thing I can look for. Now, I, I, I told you I'll, I'm gonna show you how to generate these queries. I don't need to remember them. Uh, or remember the syntax. So here's a good example. Um, you have three, let's filter our network. I have three IPs here. I wanna search for all of them. So one, two, three, extract rules, Sentinel-1. Uh, I'll just share my complete screen for a moment so you can see how this looks like. So if you're seeing now the text file here, here you go. This is the query that was generated. You can generate multiple queries. It just does that in the most logical way. So you have all these IPs looking at the destination IP. So I'm gonna take that and search for that now. Sorry. So again, what I'm searching for now is any communication where the destination IP is one of these why? Because I saw it in the behavioral analysis. And lo and behold, we have a bunch of communications. We can see in Sender 1, this is very useful, whether that connection was successful or whether it failed. And you can see here, if you look closely, that only one IP is successful, only this one. So I can just remove these if I don't see anything from them and see how many communications I had. Now, there is a tricky part. Um, we can't really know what the communication was about. I am able, uh, for example, to go to behavior here and I can download the PCAP, but you know here that this is, you can see 443 uh, SSL encrypted. So today we, uh, we don't decrypt this. So I can't really know what transferred. But based on the classification of this threat, based on being Quackbot, having it persist, having it communicate to the outside, I can know for sure this, this user needs to replace all passwords, similar to what we saw with NJRAT when we saw, um, sorry, uh, when we saw sniffing keystrokes. Um, in all the, these cases, the first thing to do, update credentials. Otherwise, you're going to be compromised again and again and again, and most likely also lose some money. Uh, so this is uh, the example here. And we see uh, over 430 communications uh, and 
you can see that they're all happening also today if I uh, change the, the event time uh, sorting. And this is simply, uh, and, and I'm telling you as the, the one who set this up, this is because of persistence. So once we kill the persistence, we won't have data escaping the organization. All this information was available. Uh, and you saw that this was done very quickly. Um, and in my opinion, um, I, I do have experience in this field, but tier one analysts with limited experience can understand these things as well. This is malware, this is not malware. Does it communicate, does it persist, where? And you can search for all of this. This is actionable data that you can use. Um, the memory scanning capability, um, I think this is very important also to emphasize. Um, it needs to, you need to be an advanced analyst to conduct memory forensics. And again, not anymore. You have this very clearly here, infected, not infected. This is the information. And also something to add here, um, coming soon, very soon, we're going to add a schedule tasks view here as well. So the endpoint scanner will already tell you whether there is persistence and where it is. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. I also want, before we, we summarize, um, uh, for you to know, if you have Sendel one if you have CrowdStrike, you can start using this today, uh, essentially. We have a free community edition where you can sign in, join. You have all capabilities for two weeks as if you were a full uh, client of ours. And you can also ask for uh, to connect to uh, any of these solutions. You can see here, by the way, in the dashboard, you can connect sources. You can choose Sentinel-1, for example. And have a video as well that explains how, and you just put the API token, your URL, that's it, uh, and you're already connected. Um, by the way, if you're not using Sender One or CrowdStrike, I just want to say that we're also um, adding a support for Windows Defender by the end of this year. So if you join now, you can also start using it manually. Um, you'll get an update when that happens. Uh, I also wanted to mention um, regarding proactive uh, hunting, as I mentioned before, it's not only reactive that we respond to your alerts, uh, we can also hunt uh, proactively based on trending threats, based on threats that uh, you deem important, and then you can also um, uh, get this information, get new detections, and hunting it also uh, happen um, following an incident. All I've done today is available already. Uh, and a lot of things are out, uh, upcoming. So for example, automating this hunting process, choosing the artifacts, generating the rule and hunting for it will be fully automated as well. Um, so again, stay tuned. So just to summarize before I, I move to the questions, uh, we went over uh, the issues in security operations and challenges, possible solutions, uh, how we can solve it using automation. Um, we went through several examples. So false positive, reduction, acceleration of investigation, clear classification of uh, everything in the middle. So grayware, potentially unwanted software and classification of malware, recommendations and actionable intelligence. Potentially you can also automatically uh, remove these alerts. You can automatically hunt. Uh, that is what we do. And as I mentioned before, we can also uh, add our human team on top of that uh, to support more complex cases uh, or escalations. Uh, and I think that's generally it. Let's see if you have questions and uh, I, I hope to be able to answer them. Joseph asks, so if it injects into another process, that would be visible in memory scanning. So yes, um, uh, Quackbot specifically, that's exactly what it does. It chooses a process, usually a system process that has to be up. It injects itself into it and, and deletes traces. So once you use the endpoint scanner, you can know immediately whether you're infected or not. I've personally tested it on several uh, environments. And even in cases sometimes where the EDR does not even alert you where there is still a threat in memory, our endpoint scanner will be able to identify that. Great, and I've got another question here, Shal, that the, I think you like answered a bit, but somebody asked, and I just wanted to really dig into this. Um, so Sentinel-1 does pull in a lot of context and they have the timeline tab, they have the threat hunting section, 
And, you know, what information are we using for sent from Sentinel-1 that, and, you know, what are we doing differently that, just to reiterate on that, because we're not, our, our determinations and verdicts don't always match up with Sentinel-1 perfectly. So can you just dig in a little bit about like, what's the kind of additional context that you're not necessarily going to find in Sentinel-1, or if you do find, maybe you have to do a bit more work or use another sandbox or really, you know, dig deeper to actually pull out that information that you're needing. Excellent. Uh, so, of course, uh, as Sentinel-1 are our par partners, also other EDR solutions, and uh, without them, we can't do what we do. Because uh, detection is the first step in the chain. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the initial detection is caused by behavior. Uh, and the threat indicators are part of that. So first is the ability to remove false positives. Uh, so that's already something that we add on top. The uh, context that is provided for threats, um, as you mentioned, you can hunt now. You can click here and hunt now for this file. Uh, it's important for me to show it as well. And it will show you any event that is related to the file. Um, I can tell you from my experience with the solution, uh, it is very uh, file focused. So I'm looking for the hash, I'll see events relating to the hash. But once you move to the realm of memory and in-memory threats, um, it, you become a bit uh, lacking uh, because you don't know which processes uh, uh, are running or did run, and what did they do, um, and what kind of persistence mechanisms might be there. Again, the information, uh, most of it can be found, but you need to know what to look for. Um, and again, as the more information that you have, it's harder to determine. So the information that you get in Intezer, again, is actionable. Uh, it's not that you need to, you know, jump into the pool and look for uh, whatever, something hidden there. You have the information here. You can know what to look for. You can already get the query. Um, so you can understand, as I did, using Sentinel-1 uh, information, uh, understood whether I was compromised or not. Uh, above that, of course, we, we do a lot of logic behind it in order to take the information from our solution and provide you with that uh, definitive verdict. Um, so. Um, there's a lot of, of calculations behind it in order to, you know, also not to lead you astray. We don't want to, to tell you that something is malicious while it is not. Um, and from our data so far, uh, we're, we're successful at that. Yeah, and you also showed off the, the family uh, page where you can hunt by family versus mm. single files, as well as the, I think, threat clustering where, you know, instead of looking at an individual file and having to dig into a timeline or threat hunting for an individual file, you're able to see the cluster of all those alerts that are correlated to, to match. So that way you can, instead of responding to the individual alerts by timeline and threat hunting, you're able to actually go through and you can respond to a group of similar alerts, correct? Exactly. So um, what you mentioned, I think is important, Shannon, about the families. Um, again, we're on the one hand reacting to incidents, but on the other, the information that we collect and provide also helps us uh, and the teams be prepared for future attacks. Here, for example, I clicked on Quackbot and we see the family page. And here you can actually see that the detect and hunt tab is effective to the entire family. So I can choose network artifacts or any of the other artifacts that we've seen for the entire family. And I can use them to extract rules, to add detections uh, for my organization. Um, and with trending threats, I think that's very important. Great, and I've got a couple more questions here. So there's one, you know, why are some results unknown? So, and I'm not sure, but I think, you know, sometimes you'll see things both in Sentinel-1, but as well as Intezer, where Intezer will say, hey, you know, this one's one you want to investigate. So why, why would some be unknown or to investigate? And, you know, how would you address those? That's a great like question. As, as an analyst, what do you dig into first? Yeah, so uh, let's focus here on the trial side. And what uh, what you mentioned is this 15% in this example to investigate. Uh, so first, false positives we put to the side. Um, we don't need to, to, to look at them. Um, we will begin with confirmed malicious because this is the most urgent stuff that we can verify that are in fact malicious. And then everything in between is less determinative. 
Um, and in the end, we can't know uh, everything about every single file. Um, so anything that is uh, purple means that we didn't have enough confidence to say that it's legit. It also means that we didn't see any suspicious behavior or malicious behavior to deem it malicious. But it also means we're not certain. We haven't seen the code before. Although we didn't see malicious behavior, we're not comfortable in saying this is completely legit. These are the cases that I would leave for my free time uh, to go over, to verify. Uh, and if they are false positives, something great that you can do in the system is add that code as legitimate. So for example, let's say you, you installed a new application uh, in, and, and you know everyone has it in the organization. And we at Intezer, we've never seen that thing before. It doesn't happen often, but it can. Uh, so it will be, if it triggers an alert, be identified as uh, purple, as to investigate. Once you see that, you can talk to us, you can do it on your own, you can index that code as trusted, and you'll never see an alert, and, and, uh, you know, a to investigate on it again. You'll see uh, no threats. Um, and that's true not only for that particular hash or version of the software, because once we know the code, we'll see it being reused in the future. So you're basically future proof against that false positive. Yeah, and I think one of the, the use cases as well to reduce that to investigate, that's proprietary code as well, right? So you can privately index if you have like uh, custom software or proprietary code or something like that, that Intezer is not gonna recognize as malicious, it's not gonna recognize as trusted from Microsoft or something like that. You can, that's what you're saying, you can privately index that so that way in the future, your in-house code won't and proprietary stuff won't show up as needing to investigation, correct? Exactly. exactly. Great. Yeah. And so there's another one here. And I think this is a really interesting feature as well. The how does Inser do those scans on endpoints? Is so is there is an agent? Do we use ex existing Sentinel one um, agent for those scans? Like what do, what does Inser do when there's one of those file lists alerts? Yeah, so regarding the, the scanner, again, you don't need to install anything. It's one portable executable file. You can deploy it remotely uh, through any deployment tools, source, or the EDR, as I showed possible through Sentinel-1. What it does, and again, it's completely proprietary. You don't use any third parties there. It scans the memory, uh, executable code in memory specifically, including injections, including uh, um, um, evasive payloads. And we extract all of those binaries. Binaries are our bread and butter. So we break them down, we disassemble them, compare them to code we've seen previously and bring back the classification in a view of the full endpoint. That whole process takes about three minutes from start to finish. Um, and I, I still think it's science fiction. Uh, so yeah, um, uh, in-memory threats, fileless threats, that's the thing. Gotcha. Yeah, just a couple more here. So the extract rules are meant for threat hunting in specific EDR solutions, as you showed. Are there extracted rules that you can copy and use as queries in SIM solutions? Or what would you want to do if, you know, you want to use a rule that's not one of the, you know, uh, cut and paste kind of extracted rules? Yeah, I see this is a question for from uh, Yaron. Uh, thank you for joining, Yaron. It's great to see a question from you. Um, yeah, so you saw there that currently we can generate um, rules for Sentinel-1 and CrowdStrike. That's in order to facilitate that automated flow with the EDR. Uh, the next stage there is to provide more generic rules like Sigma, OS Query. Uh, so then you, you'll be able to use uh, that in other platforms as well. Okay. And I think this is a really interesting question moving to um, Mike asks, after something gets marked as trusted, does it become untrusted when it's updated? Does Intezer trust it forever? Is it, how does Intezer really decide, you know, if you see something again, is it trusted always? So I think this is a great last question also to finish with, because this is a deep question about how the technology works actually. And let's talk about how we classify code. Essentially, if we've seen code in trusted software, and only in trusted software, it will be trusted. If we've seen this code only in malware, it will be identified as malware. And of course, that can go down to the particular families, tools, um, vendors, et cetera. 
Now, the, the question is, what do you do with everything in between? There's so much code, most of the code, I think, out there has been used both by legitimate vendors and by malware, and that code usually is libraries, okay? So the way our technology works is that once we see code in multiple sources, so in, in trusted software, and now we see it also in malware, that portion of the code that was seen in both will become common. So it won't affect, it won't be trusted or uh, malicious, it will be neutral. And that's a very important concept. So it's not uh, that we say, this is a hash, this hash is always malicious, never, you know, never mind what. Uh, because the hash, you know, it changes all the time. We look at the code. So if, uh, let's say we have uh, something legitimate, you know, a legitimate applica application, uh, or let's say we have malware, it's, it's classified as malicious, all of its code, uh, but then we find trusted software that shares some code with that malware. Uh, we can index that as legitimate and then a portion of that malware will become common. So it doesn't change the verdict. Each file should remain with their own verdict, but the, the granularity might change. So some code might be then classified as common, classified as trusted, et cetera. Uh, this is how the technology works. Perfect. And I think we have one last question that I want to wrap us Good up. Good one. With. What are the next year roadmaps development? You you alluded to a couple of things. We have we've built a lot of things in the last year, and 2023 is going to be a big year. You know, what are some of the things besides like Microsoft Defender that we're really investigating on building out into into Zerge Solution? Excellent, and thank you, Omer, for the question. Uh, it's happy. I'm happy to see you know, familiar names here. Um, so, uh, first, uh, as you mentioned, uh, is additional uh, sources. So, Microsoft Defender, more source, uh, and more, more proactive actions. So, the ability to really control what is hunted, how it is hunted proactively, the ability to automatically hunt for detected threats and conduct more automatic uh, automatic uh, uh, capabilities, scanning memory uh, for other operating systems, supporting dynamic analysis of other uh, uh, operating systems, um, enhancing the, the integration, lowering the amount of unknowns, uh, et cetera. Um, the, the, the goal, and I think that will make it the clearest, is to provide whatever tier one provides in an automated fashion. Uh, so also to support, sorry, the dog was good for an hour, minus two minutes. Um, yeah, so so anything that can support us with, uh, you know, covering as much as possible, as much of the alerts and bringing back determinative, uh, determinative uh, answers. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you got some really good insights into, you know, how this can help you out and really uh, hopefully save you a lot of time and effort in the future. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, everyone.